for Parliament's National Security Committee. I can see Interior CS Dr. Fred Matiangi is already addressing the committee there. Let's listen in. True. One of the lawyers swore an affidavit to that effect. And two, that he was detained at the airport, both of which were not true. Because, Mr. Chairman, as you know, according to uh, migration rules around the world, until a passenger establishes himself or herself by going through the immigration section, they remain on the air side of the airport. And when they remain on the air side of the airport, they cannot be held in custody by the police. Stamiguna was not arrested, which is a fact. He was not in the custody of the Inspector General of Police. So there is no way the Inspector General of Police could produce someone in court who was not in his custody. I can say it here for the record, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Members, we did not confiscate Mr. Miguna's passport. And now, he has admitted himself and made the statement that actually the passport is with him, and he has admitted that he deliberately refused to give the passport to be stamped. On that day, on Wednesday, the Attorney General spent the day in court begging to be heard because when the first judge made an order that Muguna be produced in court the following day clearly the judge A was not interested in the compliance with the previous judge's uh, orders and B did not have an opportunity to hear from the director of immigration and uh, the director of immigration was being required to do the impossible he was not, could not produce somebody who was not already cleared and was not in Kenya but we couldn't be heard. I mean, the, the judge flatly refused and said they could not hear us. Um, at one o'clock, the same judicial officer made an order that the Inspector General of Police, the PS and myself, appear in court personally one and a half hours later. Again, for the record, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Members, we were at the GSU pass out parade in Embakasi. Many of you, Honorable Members in this committee, are very exposed people very experienced people, you understand this. Many of you have been in this sector before. The GSU Pass Out Parade is a Spartan straight ceremony that follows a tradition. You can't interrupt in the middle. We don't even carry cell phones to that function. And we didn't know that such an order had been made until way after the function when my PS interior, Dr. Kibijo, said, by the way, an officer rang me up to say that you are supposed to appear before a judge. He said, but we have not even been served uh, any court orders in the first place and there is no way we would be there anyway because we were the GSU pass out parade I'm told the judicial officer said the GSU pass out parade is not that important and then when the attorney general begged even further almost on his knees that we have actually not been served the judicial officer said we have been on TV the whole morning by now the officials should know that we have ordered they come before us Mr. Chairman, Honorable Members, we don't watch TV at the GSU pass out parade so, the long and short of it is that the Attorney General continued to bleed that we be heard so that we can explain our side of the story, which did not happen throughout. The long and short of it is that we got finally condemned and heard and condemned on the basis of lies. And now that I have this opportunity, Mr. Chairman, the Constitution says that cabinet secretaries are accountable to the people of Kenya through Parliament. Now I have to be accountable to you. And I want to say this for the record. I have not been served one court order. One, not two, one. I've not been served any court order. And none of these, my brothers, has been served a court order. This is not a story. This is something that can be proved in a court of law. A judicial officer would ask for an affidavit of service, for example, to prove that I was actually served. I have not been served a court order. And actually... Forgive me about the question of being served. I am not aware of any attempt to serve me or serve any of these officers a court order. So anyway, the long and short of it is that when it was impossible for us as government to do that which we were ordered to do, we were helpless. Our immigration department did not have an option but to remove. Mr. Chairman, I'm using these words advisedly to remove Mr. Muguna as an undocumented and established passenger on transit to his last port of call. 
And I think it's important for everyone to understand this, especially even our friends and colleagues from the media. Mr. Miguna was not deported. Because if he was deported, I would have had to sign a deportation order. We couldn't deport him because he was not in Kenya. He had not been cleared. So he was not in our custody. He was not within our jurisdiction. We did not deport him. He was a passenger on transit who did not establish himself, who did not identify himself, who did not produce his credentials, and according to international convention, he was removed from the air side of the airport to his last port of call, which was Dubai, because that's where he came from. The reason why the Emirates carried him is because that is the plane on which he flew. And let me give you an example to demonstrate that, which amazes me that the, the media has not picked it. We have someone at the airport here, JKA, who has spent four months, someone from an African country who has been here for four months, at JKA because they voluntarily renounced their citizenship of their country, took the citizenship of a country in the Middle East. When that country uh, revoked the citizenship, he came to Nairobi, flew by KQ to his previous country or to his country of birth. When he arrived there, he couldn't be admitted because he had renounced the citizenship of his country. They shipped him back to his last port of call which was Jomo Kenyatta International Airport he has been here for four months he probably has started a fifth month today you read in the papers today about someone who has spent 15 years at the airport in Paris this happens around the world people need to understand how these immigration systems work we are signatories to strict conventions that we have to follow when these things happen, it has nothing to do with the government as it were. That is why the simple act of giving your passport to be stamped, and as I said, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Members, it takes less than a half a minute for your passport to be stamped and the airport to be cleared. It's a requirement in immigration. You have to fulfill it. And no one is above it. Let me tell you, no one is above it. The Pope had his passport stamped here. President Barack Obama had his passport stamped here. Our own president, His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, had his passport stamped there last night at 7.25 when he arrived from Mozambique. All of you honorable members travel, and when you come back into the country, your passports are stamped there. It doesn't take away your citizenship. It's a very simple act of migration. Last two things I'd like to say before I invite my two colleagues. Our actions are guided by law. The Kenya Citizenship and Immigration Act 2011 was not enacted by the executive branch of government. It was enacted by parliament. Our responsibility as the executive branch of government is to implement that law. It has got prescriptions on what happens when you have lost your citizenship, especially in the context of Constitution of Kenya 2010. Among the documents we are going to file, Mr. Chairman, honorable members, is a ruling by the honorable Justice Isaac Renaola on a similar matter, in which Justice Renaola expressed himself clearly that anyone who deceives themselves that when they lost their citizenship before the Constitution 2010 was enacted and they can gain it without going through the application procedure is deceiving themselves. The law is in black and white. Since we enacted, since we enacted the law, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Members, 3,000 Kenyans, 3,000 Kenyans, since the enactment of the law, 3,000 Kenyans have applied for, the, for their citizenship to be regularized. We call it regularized because it's not essentially for them to be confirmed as citizens, but it's for their citizenship to be regularized. And by the way, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Members, they don't have to do that physically by being in Nairobi. Of the 3,000 Kenyans who have applied for regularization of their citizenship, about 2,000 of them in the US, in Canada, in the UK have done so online. They have written online, they have applied online, and they have had it all done. If Mr. Miguna wanted, he would actually do it from Ottawa or Toronto, wherever he is, and he would get it. It's a simple, straightforward uh, process. We took these documents to him to the airport. He told them. We did all we could uh, in that particular case to fulfill uh, the requirements of the law. Did we comply with court orders and do we comply with court orders? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. We always comply with court orders. Because we, there is evidence we have done that. There isn't the time we have been ordered to do something by the court and we haven't done it. In every aspect of this and many other things that we have dealt with, we have almost religiously complied with court orders, even when sometimes we find 
it's very difficult to uh, comply with those orders. But we have no choice. They are court orders, we comply with them. Did we, um, were we contemptuous of the court? I believe no. And that's why, Mr. Chairman, we have gone to the Court of Appeal this morning on the matter. And we are so dissatisfied with the manner in which this was done that we have filed a complaint through the Office of the Attorney General to the Judicial Service Commission on the manner in which the judicial officers who handled this matter conducted themselves. We were not heard. There was no evidence we were heard. They took decisions based on lies. And at the end of it all, we have been condemned and you have all these shenanigans that you have here. Later on, I will demonstrate to you, and you especially, because you are members who are in charge of our ministry from parliament. There's something I would like you members to know, and I will do a disservice to the country if I leave this sitting without letting you know that. Our ministry and our sector is the most affected by some of the decisions that are made by a section of the judiciary. The ensuring law and order is a very sensitive matter. On the crackdown on illegal gambling machines, I think I have over 30 or so court orders. On uh, the crackdown on illicit brews, we have nearly 40 court orders. You know, and all these, the bulk of these orders are expected. In other words, someone walks into court, get, comes out with an order, and we have no chance of being heard. In this case of Miguna, of the over 13 or so court orders that have been made on this matter, about 11 of them are expected. In other words, we've not had a chance to be heard, you know, where you, you present your case. Because had the judge, for example, listened to us on Wednesday morning, they would have, for example, learned how difficult it is to get a passenger, like that gentleman who has been there for four, four months, to get him out of there and take him to court. How would you do it? Because he's on the other side, he has not presented his passport, he has no citizenship, he has nothing. How would you now smuggle him from there and take him to, to court? And then you're asking the Inspector General of Police to present someone they don't have. Because he's not in our jurisdiction, he's not in our custody, we have not arrested him. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, uh, Honorable Members, we obey court orders and we respect the decisions of the judiciary. And we always will, because if we don't, we will violate the law. Number two, that, however, imposes responsibilities on us and on our friends in the judiciary. The right to be heard is probably the most basic of all. We have not been served with any court order. And therefore, we cannot be contemptuous of an order that we have not been served. Lastly, the Minister for Interior has no powers under the law to determine the citizenship of a person. That is why, if you read the Act, it uses language carefully. You regularize your citizenship after you have rescinded it yourself voluntarily and prescribes the forms that have got to be filled. The 3,000 Kenyans who have done that already uh, filled the same form. Every week, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Members, every month actually, I signed between 20 and 150 of those uh, citizenships that Kenyans regularize. It's a simple form. I wish I would give you a five-minute form. It's a very simple form. And by the way, you know, it is not us who prescribed that. If you amended this act and repealed it, I wouldn't have to require the form. And the Director of Immigration Services would not require the form. So, which law is inferior to the other? What do we do we obey uh, our whims and reject the law that we exist in our statute books as it were? So we've done the best we, we could. Mr. Miguna is free to apply, even now as I speak, but if he had gone to a computer when I started speaking, by now he would have completed filling that form. And by now, the form would be on the way from immigration to my office for signature. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as ABC. He doesn't even have to say, I'll come tomorrow or come next year. Or, he can come this afternoon. He can any time he wants. It's a simple, straightforward document that everyone who wants to do that feels. So I don't understand why it's an issue, as it were, at the moment. And then, then there's for the judicial officers, who actually include some of the lawyers who have sworn affidavit in court lying about actions that we have not taken, we will behave as responsible citizens. We will file a formal complaint with the Law Society of Kenya. And as I said this morning, I have requested the Office of the Attorney General 
because the Attorney General is the bridge between the executive and the judiciary to file a formal complaint with the Judicial Service Commission on that matter. That is it to be said at the moment, Mr. Chairman, and with your very kind indulgence as an overview, I would then ask General Kialango to say one word in case I forgot anything from their briefing and the Inspector General before we take your questions. General Kialango. The information is very important for this. Unless this is another statement by Parliament, then we will go and see if we have this chairman. The sitting, <coughs> the sitting of the Parliament means that when somebody is quoting a document which is referring to, we need to be supplied with that document so that as he speaks, we refer to the document. That's the rule of the law of the, this house, unless you have changed it. Anybody, any witness called by a, a committee of Parliament, Whenever he's going to refer, he has to supply this committee in advance so that as they refer to it, we have the document we refer also. That was the information of the spirit. He has referred to the ruling by the judge, the constitution, and he was supposed because I believe the clerk wrote to the, the relevant ministry. They were to respond, they give us the document they are going to refer. So that we can get with them, they now fine. That's what the information will be given to us. That's the new rules. You cannot bend it. Cabinet Secretary, I think uh, my Cabinet Secretary has really uh, detailed all that uh, uh, we had agreed on and all I can say and probably let the members know that a journey at an international level can only be complete when the embankment point is known and by the time you are coming to your destination, then that journey will be complete. In that case, the journey for Miguna was not complete because we did not know where he had embarked from. The other thing that I want to say is that sometimes people say that how did he end up being returned? I think in a cow, Annex 9 properly stipulates if a person destroys his document or fails to produce his travel document at the point of entry, then what will happen is if the history of that person, first of all, you indemnify the carrier that brought him. The second thing that if you have got any details of that individual which can form part of that, and that is the document we were able to avail to the carrier that brought him, and Meguna then returned to his last point of call before he came here. That is all I need to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Chairman of this distinguished committee and the honorable members. I, I just want to say that uh, the cabinet secretary has said <coughs> inspector of the national police services is a correct position and that is what we were required to do as per that order the order was very specific ours was to provide security for that gentleman upon his regular entry into, into this country which up to this point in time he did not and he has not that's all I wish to say at this point. Thank you very much. That's all we can say, Mr. Chairman, honorable members. We can take your questions. Thank 
Democrat Kenyans, even as we engage the CS and the immigration and police, we should um, know that even as Kenyans right now, there are many people who are looking at this issue because I remember the other day, or even a threat to, to cancel the direct flight to the US because of such a thing that happened at the airport. And also, all of us, we do we are, are travelers, we, we travel to other countries. And when we enter any other country, we know we are not in America until we go to immigration and customs, and then we are in America. So even as we engage the immigration and police, that is the situation. And of course, the CS is what we need to and the, and the police. I don't know why they are going to arrest somebody who is in a, in a no man's uh, land and uh, arrest him and bring him to court. And um, we have a problem and I think all our arms of government, we should work together. We should work together. Because we embarrass our own government, the people are not in the hands. So let's ask the street to get a job, immigration, police. If you have seen somewhere where they are not in the land. And that is the way to go as a country. And uh, I would say some of these things are done to, to derail what the government wants to do. This is the time we should be working, but not uh, talking about the issues of the Buddha. We should actually be talking about uh, the law. And uh, there are many people. Because you have not suffered, uh, furnish us with the relevant document you are, uh, you are citing. So I believe immediately before we, we do our report, you will furnish us with those particular uh, documents. Two, and director of the question, director. Yes, the chairman, uh, I want to ask this question. Who drug the good? Because he was not a citizen of Kenya by then, he was at the Kenyan airport, but it's in the public domain that he was dragged. So is it the, the, the Dubai people, is it the immigration people, or is it the Kenyan government? My question, uh, my question number two, before Mikuna was deported, Chairman, he had a court order that was supposed to be produced 
in Kenyan court before it was the first deportation. There was a court order that it was supposed to be produced in court, and the government of Kenya deported. To the best of the best practice of the president is once a court order is issued, it can only be invalid if another one is issued after it. So to me, the first one was still standing because Nigona was to be produced by the Kenyan police station where he was held by that time before he was deported. What transpired, because he was in Kenya again, at the same time, the government was supposed to produce it in court. My question number three, uh, question number three is, uh, we agree when we were in uh, Mr. Uh, the BS or immigration. I would love you to go back to answer. Members ask the question about how to manage things which can break, damage the image of this country. He answered very well that is going to take care of that. Unfortunately, less than one month, this country was really embarrassed. The issue here is not about Migoda Migoda Banajama. The issue here is about Kenyan image being tarnished. Because there was other ways which Migoda would have been handled at the airport. But the way it was done, be it by the police, and the immigration, whoever, was wrong. So I want you to get to the answers of this particular committee. We were in the same floor when we interviewed the PS for immigration. And the issue of handling the bonus case was raised. And we agreed as a committee that anything happening which can destroy or uh, 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 the image of the, uh, the country need to be done in a formal way. So I will leave answer concerning that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will take one more question okay. before we go to another round. Then we go to the yeah, okay. yeah, okay. 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 Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have about two questions. Uh, from the CSC's presentation, it is very clear that Uguna didn't step in case. It was the other side of the airport. I would want to hear when is the other side of the airport. We saw police handling more or security people handling him. Were those security people from outside Kenya or were they Kenyans? And if they were Kenyans, where did they take the order to mishandle the Buddha? The second question relates to the issue of where Miguna was in terms of, uh, uh, we saw him in a, in a toilet somewhere. It was important it was a toilet. Can you confirm that whether that was a toilet or it was a cell? And if so, then, would this still be being administered from outside pay? The other question we saw some of our colleagues, politicians like us, also being mishandled. You know, we, we saw Miguna being rushed like the way you do with a sack. Very fast into a room locked, and I do believe strongly those were security people. So I want to hear from the inspector of police whether the people we saw pushing the gun out through to a room somewhere, whether they were security people, and if they were, police commander or the inspector general of police, were well, those your officers? Did they take orders from you? Because you said you really did nothing to do that, the whole exercise. The last question, the, 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 the image of the country is already there. Despite the explanation you are going to give us, outside there, our image as a country is already, to some extent, damaged. Then, can you also indicate to us, because you implement our laws and whatever we do, can you indicate to this committee what strategy you are going to put in place to kind of salvage the national image? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let, let's uh, answer those uh, three questions. And after that, I'll come to Kodosh. And I'll come to Kabinga, and I'll come to the Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, once again, for the great questions and, 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 and the advice from the committee. Um, I, I will respond to some questions. I'm going to ask the Inspector General to respond specifically to one and the, uh, the PS migration. There is no doubt that Miguna was born in Kenya. I don't think that is, that is a matter of debate, uh, Honorable Kaunya. It's not, it's not in doubt that he was, he was born in Kenya. The question uh, I'm saying is, is not in doubt that uh, uh, Miguna was born in Kenya. 
you know, honorable members, th th there's something I would like to ask all of us in that same sense of collective responsibility of government. Parliament or the legislative arm of government is as much government as the executive branch. And the judiciary is as much government as the executive branch. You are government and you make these decisions and you pass the laws. When you look at the Kenya Citizens and Immigration Act, it clearly delineates and creates distinctions. There are Kenyans before the enactment of Constitution 2010, because that time our Constitution did not allow dual citizenship. That if you became a citizenship, a citizen of another country, you forfeited or renounced your Kenyan citizenship. In other words, you surrendered the passport, and you surrendered your citizenship in that particular sense. And under the framers of our Constitution. Uh, uh, proposed that there would be a method and parliament will enact a law and you enacted a law actually in 2011 that prescribes how those who renounced their citizenship would regain it that's why we are talking about regaining it quote unquote so that you can actually get a kenyan passport in the process and they gave a prescription it was done by parliament we are almost religiously or doggedly bound by that prescription which you gave in the kenyan citizenship and immigration act of 2011 which basically says you fill the form and once you fill the form it, it it doesn't require more than that by the way that form is a five minute affair as it were that's why as i said since 2010 constitution was enacted 3000 kenyans have already filled that form and regained their citizenship so that you get your two passports there are kenyan americans who have american passports and they also have the kenyan passport the Kenyans who have British passports and they have Kenyan passports. It's a very simple, straightforward. But you know, from a security point of view, because you are a security committee, it's important to know that that process was necessary because it assists you to filter who actually you gave. Because some people could come under the guise of regaining citizenship and end up getting our passport and misusing it. It was done for that particular check. And the prescription that is there culminates in the CS signing. But it doesn't give the CS the powers to deny. Like, I can't deny you citizenship. I can't say you are not a Kenyan citizen. Those powers are not in the act. So, the process that uh, Mr. Miguna is being asked to, to, to go through is the simplest of processes. A very uh, straightforward thing, which as I said, right now I have about a thousand or so applications that are coming through the system by Kenyans who are in Canada, who are in the US, Britain, South Africa, wherever, who are regaining their citizenship. It's a simple, straightforward process as it were. I suggested to the Director of Migration Services, and now actually I think I'm going to uh, uh, make the decision on my feet. I would like to submit to this committee the file that was used by the former minister in charge of migration, the Honorable Tieno Kajuang, to give Mr. Miguna Miguna a passport. You will notice yourself the fraud in it. That it was not done properly, it was not done according to the law. Ideally, actually, if we were to follow the law as it were, Honorable Members, we should have charged him in court with fraud. And we did not know this. No one knew this. The, the matter that was referred to by Honorable Masara, that, uh, you know, there was an order uh, that uh, Mr. Migona should not be deported. It is not true. I respectively say so. The order of the court was that Mr. Migona be released. And the order was given a day after he had been released. And when he was released, that is when we all discovered... Uh, the director of immigration then, General Kialangwa, discovered that actually he had traveled to the country when he was he came here last on a Canadian passport. And he had renewed his Canadian passport for 10 years in June 2017. 30 days to the general elections where he was contesting to become governor of Nairobi. Then that, of course, naturally raised questions. Allah, how did we allow then a Canadian to contest for governor of Nairobi? What happened? Then they started looking at the papers. Then they discovered actually there was an irregularity in the manner in which his documentation was arranged. At that time, the option available for government was to charge him in a court of law or to deport him. And honorable members, let me say this, we don't go to the press about this every day, but every week I sign about 50 to 60 deportation orders. Many of them, 99% of them, are for foreign nationals who are in the country illegally. I sign all those deportations all the time, even now, there are some on my, on my desk that I'm going to sign when I live here. People who came here as to work and so on and so forth. It's a routine thing. It happens all the time because obviously people would come into our country uh, with tourist visas, then we find them working and so on and so forth. So when, when the director of immigration looked at the paperwork,
because the identification documents on him that time we discovered it was a Canadian passport. When we looked at it, they had just been renewed in July 2017. And then we said, okay, let's follow up. How did he travel here? He traveled here on a Canadian passport. I, we may actually have made a mistake. Then that is how he was deported. But you see, the constitutional court quashed the deportation order, demanded the order that we allow him to come back, and actually recognized that he had a Canadian passport because they ordered us to allow him to come back using his Canadian passport. And that's why we went to the airport and we hoped that he was going to give his Canadian passport to be stamped, which he refused. So, so, so the, the, the way this has been done, I want to confirm to you, honorable members, it is not out of the ordinary. I mean, it's not unusual. It does not be done specifically for him just because he's Miguna. It happens to many, many other people. And, 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 and I could, uh, you know, table before you many other examples of this kind in the past. There are Kenyans right now who are married to foreigners who are trying to regularize their citizenship under the law and so on. It's a very common thing. It happens all the time. There is nothing specific or peculiar for this particular uh, Kenyan, as, as it were. The question of um, the image of the country has been raised by the two members of parliament. Well, you know, much as uh, the times when I ask myself, again, in the same spirit, honorable members of collective responsibility because you are government yourselves you know when you wake up in the morning if, if you saw the frustrations we went through on monday even looking for the minister of foreign affairs the judge did not order us to do that even requesting my colleague the minister of foreign affairs to persuade the canadian high commissioner but you see if they don't believe us at least they will believe the canadian high commission so that the canadian high commissioner can send consular officers to the airport they will receive Mr. Miguna, treat him well, persuade him to give his passport to be stamped so that he can come out of the airport. All that is in line to trying to do our best. We try, let me tell you, honorable members, we try. Then you are faced with a situation such as this where, even with the best of intentions, I, I have been asking everybody, what, what would a wiser person than us do? Because you are confronted with a situation where you, you have, uh, he has refused to give his Canadian passport. Then you have said, okay, usually Kenyans will go to Nyayas to apply. No, no, no. Take his papers to the airport and give them to him to fill there. I remember the peers asking me that day, uh, CS, you have to be around so that you sign the document when he has filled it. I said, wherever I am, just call me. I will sign it. Bring it. Even if I'm in a meeting, I will step out to sign it so that we get done with this charade, you know, that is uh, annoying and hurting the country. Then he tore the papers at the airport. So, so you see, appreciate those of the difficulties in which we find ourselves as it were we, we do our best so when you're asking us what measures are we going to put in place i think what we need to do is every time we get an opportunity and many of us including yourselves honorable members you get this opportunity when you travel out of the country you meet kenyans who live in the u.s kenyans who live in canada who live in britain they will ask these questions many of them ask like i was being asked the other day by kenyans in the u.s how can i regain my citizenship what can i do it's good to educate them, to tell them to understand. I mean, this is a country you love, it's your motherland. Why would you want to cause such a hula baloo on a straightforward issue like this? You are being told to fill a paper for five minutes. Why should that be a problem? So that we educate everyone to understand that we have an equal responsibility to protect the image of our country as we go forward. But otherwise, the truth of the matter is that uh, it's not the intention of government everything was done everything that could be done by a government was done at that place and we went beyond even the orders of the court by now looking at the canadian government and talking to them my colleague the minister was speaking to the canadian high commissioner in nairobi and she was also speaking to our mission in ottawa to see what they could talk to the minister of foreign affairs in canada to see how best we could actually address and help this gentleman uh, to have had you know this necessary uh, you know melodrama we, our best. we will try our best to educate our people to understand that sometimes we don't have to argue and quarrel over trivial small things like filling a piece of paper, like having your passport stamped. Everyone has their passport stamped. Everyone, including yourselves, honorable members, when you travel. That doesn't make you uh, less of a Kenyan. It doesn't deny you your citizenship. Even the president, as I told you last night, he had his passport stamped when he was coming back from Mozambique. Everyone, even President Obama when he came here, the Bob, everyone has their passport stamped. So why there is too much drama on this kind of issue and, and, and so on and so forth? I'll let the IG respond to the question of the officers. And uh, there was a specific question to the PSE migration on whether or not he has gone back uh, on what he promised he was going to do. Yes.
okay. on the toilet. Uh, Chair, honorable members, through my cabinet secretary, I want to assure the honorable members that it is very unfortunate that the only photograph that was shown where Dr. Meguna was staying was the toilet. But that is a self-contained room with a bed and mattress and beddings. The only part that they thought was very sensitive to be shown was the toilet. And in any case, you saw that is a very clean washroom. That's number one. <laughs> number two, I want to comment on the issue of handling of sensitive matters. Honorable members, it is true I was before you and you cared that I guard your borders. And that is the job I have up to now. Honorable members, if you will ever travel and you misplace your document and you have nothing to show at JKIA, you will go back to your destination because that is what the law is all about. So it is not only a Miguna affair, it is about any other person traveling into this country because you gave me the mandate and I'm only following the book. We made all the effort. I had a chance, honorable members, to talk to Advocate Harvey. I had a chance to talk to Kaminwa almost five times, them asking me, General, what is it that we can do so that we make this Dr. Miguna understand, do ABC. I advise them accordingly. But for me to stay with undocumented person at the airport and looking at the temperatures, it was only ideal for me to use the options that were left to me. The people who were able to take, repatriate Miguna, or rather return him to the aircraft, were actually the Department of Immigration that addresses the issue of investigation and prosecution. So it's not a police affair. So what then would have happened if we allowed Miguna to come back into this country without papers? We would have set a precedence that we would have not met internationally. One, the international community would have believed that someone can actually begin his journey from the air yes. and end up yeah. Yeah. entering into this country. For that matter, then, it is a risk place to come. So we were only guarding the precedence that we were actually going to create if we allowed that. But as the cabinet secretary has said, if Dr. Meguna goes ahead to feel what is expected of him and which is captured in the constitution. I don't think there could be any drama. It is not my wish, honorable members, to cause drama of any kind. It is only my wish I do facilitation, but within the law. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I was asking the question by Honorable Kawunya about the use of ID in East Africa. The East African protocol provides that we can use now IDs to move within East Africa. Uh, Mr. Miguna did not originate in East Africa, so he couldn't use his ID to cross over. I mean, we use IDs to go to Uganda, to uh, Rwanda. Citizens of Rwanda use IDs to come to Kenya when you're moving within East Africa. So m Mr. Miguna did not originate in Uganda, Tanzania, or in, in Rwanda, so he couldn't come in, uh, you know, using the ID. Uh, Honorable Mazara asks the question, who dragged Miguna? First of all, I don't know and I am not aware that uh, Mr. Miguna was dragged. Therefore, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Because you see, Mr. Miguna was on the air side of the airport. You know, there are so many lies and stories that are being told around this. There's so many spinning that is being told about this. I want to be on record as a minister in charge of immigration. I am not aware that Mr. Miguna was dragged. I am not aware. And if I'm not aware, I therefore can't respond to the question. I don't know. Unless there's scientific information and so on to that effect. I am not aware. And, and we are operating in a situation where you have seen the number of lies that have been told on this particular issue where a lawyer swears an affidavit in court and lies that the passport has been confiscated. The inspector general of police who did confiscate the passport and the, the PS immigration are here and I'm here. We did not confiscate the passport. Now he's bragging in Canada saying I have the passport and I refused to give it for stamping. So I am not aware of Mr. Miguna being dragged, and because of that, I cannot respond to that particular issue. Is there anything left? 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, <coughs> Thank you very much, Chairman and uh, members of this distinguished committee. I respond to the, the specific question about uh, whether we had uh, the police deployed at JKA on that material day. I wish to confirm and make reference to the Constitution that creates the National Police Service that the, the National Police Service is established under Clause 243 of the Constitution and specifically Clause 3 provides that the, the, the police service is a national service and shall be shall function throughout the Republic, including JKIA. The Constitution also provides that, I, um, that they establish a, an office of the Inspector General who exercises independent command of the National Police Service, which I do at this point in time. And one of the things that I, that I have done is to deploy officers throughout the Republic in various units and formations. And at JKIA and other airports, we have the Kenya Airports Police Unit. I wish to confirm that we have the police at the airport and on that material day their duty was to maintain law and order as is always enforce all laws, all laws and regulations preserve peace and tranquility as well as um, primarily uh, protect life and property and as uh, the PS immigration has said the task of removing that undocumented immigrant was primarily the duty of the Department of Immigration and its officers. We only came in to support them. That's all we did. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, 
for someone to aid you. That's a very serious statement. That was made on a live TV. That it's not okay for a ring spot, ring some people. So I also used to uh, uh, some who are that. Those are uh, on the issue of big gas. What the drug was very pushed because there is one we saw. <laughs> there is one we saw happen. That, uh, this guy was being pushed by a play club. A good drug. Where even the middle of a chest and one of the things that did not happen in this country, some of us run to the media when we think we cannot do it. I said, so uh, which one is it that you are buying? Uh, it is very important because one we saw a little bit. It's unfortunate that we do not can even fail. No, I was reading a joke yesterday that the guy who discovered herf. By the time he was doing the discovery, he had three used to calls for the <laughs> So it's unfortunate that we do not refuse to fail this one. But it was appropriate that you go public about it to exonerate yourself. But these are the options open for us. This is what we are pursuing. This is what the council there is refusing to do. And then we will not be here. Thank you very much. Karina, and uh, we take our point in very short because then we will go for another conversation. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Chairman. Some of us are worried by the way we trigger, uh, we take some of these words. And uh, the way we want to use some of these things to probably uh, gain political candidates and then attract political candidates. I think it will be good for that ordinary Kenyan out there. Uh, for the uh, principal secretary of education to, to let us know what it means to renounce your citizenship. Do you give back your ID? Do you give back your passport? Who are you at that point? And uh, having explained that, we want you to also confirm that all along uh, Dr. Miguna had not officially regularized his citizenship until the time, as you have put it, he was irregularly issued with these documents. And if they were irregularly issued, does it mean that now uh, he was supposed to do it afresh? I think Kenyans out there need to understand it. Uh, it is also good for you to uh, give a comment at this point, whether you think Dr. Miguna knew all along what he was doing, that he was coming here to attract international uh, attention and also to gain political mileage for his own way at the expense of security in this country. And finally, what do you think we can do as parliament to bring, bring back better relationship, better handling of court orders by the we are worried at the rate at which the two parties, the judiciary and the executive, are blaming each other when it comes to this Kenyans will understand the intelligent people that they 
get one to read. One to the other side of the same, and what? The institution is safe. And I'll apply these terms of the relationship. The medium is a student who has been given the meeting we're having here is then what I'm telling the company what is actually from Here. It's then what the story you're telling us. It's then what I'm telling us. We give the instructions for the medium to be picked up and to be handled. And uh, I'll advise you to hope that the COVID-19 will not be able to see those kind of images in the future on our aspects. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, sorry, maybe Halima, you can ask. And then after that, we have uh, one more. We have another slide here, including a friend of the community. Uh, uh, he will uh, we'll do another two rounds if he's done. Okay, Halima, ask that. <laughs> Chapter 3, Articles uh, 14, 15, 15, and 17 is talking about how somebody can Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I, again, as I said, um, uh, we're grateful for the interaction and we will, as always, and we are required by law, we'll be as honest as, as, as we ever can be and give you all the information that you need. I'll address this issue of the, of, of the media. W what amazes me, and then uh, allow me, honorable members, to speak very candidly from the bottom of my heart. You know, we, we have a country here. I want someone to tell me which international airport, where on earth, you will be filming the immigration section the way we saw the media doing. Would you do that in Heathrow? Would you be allowed to do that in Heathrow? Would you be allowed to do that in Dubai? And so on. It is unfortunate. I have to be a responsible public servant. It's unfortunate what happened to the media. And, and uh, Macheri and Jeru of the IPOA is having a meeting with me tomorrow. I, the IPOA is investigating what happened at that moment. And honorable members, as always, I will come to you when that investigation is done, what IPOA has found, and the Inspector General and myself have discussed this. We want a full-blown investigation to be done on what happened to the media at the airport so that we will go the direction the investigation will point us. At, the, at this stage, that's what I, I would like to say. But on the other hand, Honorable Members, let us step back and, and ask ourselves the question. There are certain things we do to ourselves and we do to our country that are astounding. I mean, it's now fine and dandy because of either the political uh, affiliations we have to say certain things when in actual fact we are hurting ourselves we are under review let me say here today 
and you have the security committee need to know. We are under review now for our direct flight to the US. Our competitors, Ethiopian Airways, have just gotten a third direct flight to the US. We are competing with those kinds of people. There are issues that we have to address for the sake of our economy and the sake of our country. We, we cannot be uh, we cannot be romantic about them and start saying, okay, it's fine and dandy. I can go wherever I want. I can do whatever I want. It touches on the survival of our country and the survival of our economy. And we have to really sometimes, occasionally, there are times when we feel pain, but even in that process, we help one another to do the right thing. Because as I said, you have as much responsibility as we do in the executive branch of government. The, the, some of the things that were done are not right, and I agree with the Honorable Member of Parliament who said how were media allowed to the point of filming the immigration section. And any airport of international levels like ours is a security zone. There are areas you cannot be allowed to go to. There could have been a lapse, for which I apologize, and we are looking into that. And the IPOA investigation will also look into that. That did not justify any journalist being hurt or any journalist being mistreated or something like that. We have made it very clear and we are going to work with IPOA on this matter. I will take the report of IPOA and I will go the direction the report will point me, as it were. But that said, let me talk about uh, regularizing the irregularities in, in uh, Mr. Miguna's uh, documents. Honorable Kolosh, if Mr. Miguna had been a cooperative Kenyan, you do not know as you see it here how many Kenyans have had their documents regularized without that kind of drama. Because all that you need to do when things have gone wrong is be honest enough and say, this is not right, because that's what we are trying to do. And that's our responsibility. That's why we are there. To make things work but when we make a genuine and serious effort to regularize document to make things work and let me make this revelation i know the media is here but let me make this revelation to show you how painful it has been for kenya some countries that have been giving us problems with the use of our passports are doing so because of irregularities that were done in the past in the issuance of our passports some people were arrested in some countries and they were found in possession of our passports and because of that it has taken us a long time to build relations with some countries because of that. Our president has been spending half of his international time engaging with governments on immigration-related issues because of mistakes that were done in the past. And I dare say, openly here, including by ministers who were in this ministry in the, in the past, where people sold citizenship, sold passports, did all manner of crazy things. We are trying to clean up this, and I want to be honest to the country. We must clean up this mess. And when we clean it up, it is not going to be who is involved. We must accept. We are not in these jobs to be popular. We are here to do the right thing. And I will do the right thing. We must sort this thing out. Honorable members, Apple has to Kubaliana. We have to sort this thing out. So, Golosh, I am sorting it out. That's what we are trying to do. I wish this gentleman was cooperative in the manner in which the facts are clear to him. And as I told you, Mr. Chairman, I will bring the file to you so that you peruse it yourself and see what we are talking about. It is not right that when we are trying to make a genuine effort, we are being called lots of impunity, that we are making the wrong mistakes and so on and so forth. None of these, even our colleagues in the media who are reporting this matter, none of them has gone through the facts that we are putting before them. None of them has asked the very basic questions. Now, I want to see what the Law Society of Kenya is going to do and the judiciary, now that the officers have actually lied on oath, filed affidavits in court lying. As for relations between us and the, and, and the judiciary, I want to say this. The spokesperson for the executive branch of government by constitution and by practice is His Excellency the President. I don't have powers to be a spokesperson for the executive branch of government, but I can make this observation. From this experience and the experiences we've had in the past, we're in a unique place, and you, more than any members of parliament, because you are the security committee, need to know this. Our sector is the one that is affected most by some of the decisions that are made when they are not balanced. Why are we so bothered about the checks? The constitution expects us to uphold checks and balances. Why are we not bothered about the balances? A clique of judicial officers, that's why I would not say, I would be very honest and say, this is not about the judiciary. It is about a clique of judicial officers who have gotten into an unholy relationship with a clique of activist lawyers and oppositionist civil society people with the intention of humiliating the government, 
stalling the government, embarrassing the government, and making it impossible for the government to perform. I want to give you data. You tell me yourselves as members of parliament. When I came here before, I told you, on the crackdown on illegal machines, gambling, you are the ones who represent the people of Kenya and the children of Kenya. You know what this nonsense has done to our children in the villages. I have over 26 court orders. Served all over the place. No judge, no magistrate is calm enough to say, go serve P.S. Kibicho, come before me, so that you argue your case. On crackdown on illicit brews, I have, I don't know how many court orders, I've stopped the count. Served on county commissioners, regional commissioners, chiefs, everybody. You can actually sell poison in this country because all you need is to go to court and get a court order and put it on your door and sell poison in this country. And, and no one says, let, let go, go serve them, peers. let us listen, let us hear the two of you so that we understand what the truth is. That's what I'm saying, it's a clique of judicial officers. It's not about the judiciary. Our judiciary has got some of the finest people in the country. There's a clique in the judiciary that has been captured by a group of people in civil society and a clique of activist lawyers. And they are riding roughshod. Have you wondered, members of parliament, because you have the burden of leadership, have you wondered in the last three years, one civil society activist in Kenya has obtained nearly 30 court orders, ex parte, 30 court orders, ex parte, from the court. He walks in, he gets an order, comes out. He walks in, he gets an order, comes out. In fact, he could even walk in today and say he wants an order so that all cabinet secretaries commit suicide. You'll get the order. <laughs> he walks in, gets an order, comes out. What does that say about our judicial system? Last Wednesday, the whole day, last Wednesday, the whole day, the Attorney General spent time begging for one thing, to be heard. If we had been heard by that judicial officer, they would have been told what we are telling you. Mr. Miguna is on the air side. He is not in the custody of Boynet. Boynet cannot produce him because he doesn't have him. The director of immigration would have said, this guy is not held. This would have been said. Then the judicial officer proceeds to make a 36-page ruling. Just ask yourself, a 36-page ruling in 20 minutes, even if you are a paragon, is in that evidence that there is collusion going on elsewhere and things are being brought to the judicial system to try and stall this. And then he says, when, when the judicial officer orders that we go to court, he says, let them come, but I will not hear them. What does that mean? What do you want us? Do you want us for humiliation parade? So that you can drag us by the collar through the street of public opinion. Isn't that an interest to resolve issues? How can you be condemned and heard? As I told you, this is another story. Somebody should show me this is the affidavit of service that shows that you were served a court order. This is what's happening. There is an evil clique of judicial officers working with activist lawyers and elements in the civil society who are determined to make sure that the executive branch does not function. And they will issue order after order after order after order. You cannot move. And, and, and you know, look, you are at the security committee. If Boynetti receives an anticipatory order, you know, you, you prepare to commit a crime, then you go to court and come up with an anticipatory order. We are hearing it's an invention in Kenya's judicial system, an anticipatory order. So you can't be arrested. So you go, get the order, and arrive here, and go and break into... Uh, on a Mungujiri's house, you have an order. You anticipate that you're going to make a mistake. You cannot be arrested. And and let me tell you, at a personal level, and this should be on the record, I am in Parliament. I witnessed this when I was in the Ministry of Education. Until Justice Mumbi Ngugi saved us in the education sector, we had about 30-something court orders served left, right, and center. You can't have a school board, you can't have what? On the basis of a letter, honorable members, a letter, a piece of paper that was signed by the late Mutula Kelonso, given to an individual who purported to represent all parents. And he walked around the country collecting money. He has orders in Majakos, orders in Kakamega, orders wherever, Garissa, every, nothing moves. So, if, I don't know what you can do, and I can't prescribe, because you are as much government as we are. We are equal, we are at bar. So, I can't direct you, I can't command the parliament, I can't do anything. All I can do as a member of the executive branch is present the reality and inform you as it is and you more than anyone else in the security sector to look into this and see how best this will facilitate or inhibit the management of security in the country. Because if you give an anticipated order to a criminal, Boynet is not going to arrest the criminal. 
And if you follow, those anticipated orders are being given by a certain clique of judicial officers. Not all judges who do them. It's a certain group of judicial officers. And the lawyers who go to them, you can count them. And the civil society activists involved, you can count them. It's a collusion. It's a group of people who collude and do this kind of thing. When you listen, because a judge asked me from the Commonwealth last week, a judge rang me up when this was playing up. He's a friend of mine who knows me. He's a judge from a Commonwealth country. Asked me a question I couldn't answer. Asked me, when Justice Rosalina Brilli received this application that your guy is held at the airport, was the world going to come to an end if she said, serve the director of immigration and come before me tomorrow? Was the world going to come to an end? Because that way, the director of immigration would have explained what was going on. One, we can't arrest this guy. He's on the air side. Two, he's not in our custody, so we can't produce him. Three, receive a report from us. You should see the comments of the Kenya National Human Rights Commission, which have not been heard and have not been received in court. So you have one order issued on top of another order and so on and so forth. And it's like a race within this clique of judicial officers. It's like a race on who can humiliate the executive more, who can embarrass the executive more. The more you can injunct the executive, the more you can stall the executive, the higher the officials you can embarrass, the more heroic you become. That's all I can say on that point. And lastly, the point is this, uh, honorable members. Uh, I'm not able to comment on what uh, Honorable Tucci said because I didn't see the full program. So I didn't understand the full context in which he said what he said. So it would be unfair, and again, it's a principle of collective responsibility to comment on a reported matter. I would need to see the whole thing so that I'm able to respond to, to that issue. And then lastly, uh, the issue of going public. You know, we can't go public on everything we do every day. We, we try to work as diligently as we can and hope that other people will also not only do their work, but will also be honest enough in the manner in which they conduct themselves. Tell me one thing, honorable members as leaders, why wouldn't you want to hear the government? Why on earth wouldn't you want to hear the government on a weighty matter like this? You make final orders, and when the Attorney General comes before you, you say you don't want to hear the Attorney General. When the Attorney General begs and says, the Minister and the Inspector General are at the GSU parade, you say the GSU parade is not that important. When they say they have not been served, you say, uh, I've been on TV the whole morning. I was expected to be watching TV at the GSU parade so that I know what has happened. Thank you. Secretary, if you can recall before the August uh, 2010 uh, new constitution, the government of Kenya only allowed, did not allow dual, which means you could not hold citizenship of two nationalities. It was therefore deemed that anybody who had acquired, uh, had acquired citizenship of another country at that time when dual was not allowed, it does not mean that he lost his birthright, but at that stage he was deemed to have actually gained the citizenship of the other country but lost the other one. But there was also a provision, a ride on to it, that you can regain it. 
And that's why the cabinet secretary has clearly said that even those people who are overseas today, regaining is even online. You do the regaining by applying the relevant forms. You send them to the Department of Immigration. And that is now compiled and forwarded for the CS to now endorse. And then once you regain, you'll go back to now get your ID. So ideally, the ID Miguna has today is actually an invalid document. He will, even when he regains the citizenship, he will have to, have to go to NRB to now get <coughs> his ID. And then he can now process the passport. That is as simple as that. So that process is communicated, and many Kenyans are really doing it. And then there is also repercussion. When you are a dual citizenship, there are also certain jobs you can actually get in the government, and there are certain jobs you cannot. That's why it is important. Even after the 2010 uh, constitution, you, when you are a dual, you are supposed to declare so that the government will know when to, where to engage you. I mean, you may probably not be engaged in security because you are a person who is two-legged. So we cannot really uh, entrust you with a, a number of uh, things. So there is also a rider to that when you become a dual citizen. So I think that is the only way I can explain it, Chair. Yeah, thank you very much. The way I'm landing from Gordon is that um, even amongst leaders and uh, in different government offices, there's a lot of negligence and uh, also ignorance. Because even if he was allowed uh, to stand as a governor of Nairobi, yeah. what really could have happened, really? You know? There's a lot of negligence, yeah? Issuing documents which are not supposed to be issued. Yes. Allowing people to be doing things which are not allowed to do. That is ignorant. We, we should start to not be cooperative. Well, Interior CS Dr. Fred Matiangi, Police Boss Joseph Boynet, Immigration PS Gordon Kialango, who was the last speaker there before, of course, more questions were fired uh, by the chairperson of the uh, National Security Committee, that's Honorable Paul Koinange, all speaking and giving details about the deportation of lawyer Miguna Miguna. In a nutshell, uh, CS Matiangi has stated and repeatedly affirmed that Miguna was not arrested nor detained at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. The government of Kenya did not seize Miguna's passport at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. He also went on to say that uh, they had not been served with any court order. And uh, in addition, Miguna was not deported. This is according to C.S. Matiangi. Rather, he was removed as an undocumented person. Um, C.S. Matiangi also stating that he was not aware that Miguna was dragged. Uh, and Miguna said that he was dragged. And one of the reasons why he's in a hospital in Canada is because he says he needs to get checked and find out what sort of um, medicines or drugs may have been injected into his system. But in addition, C.S. Matiangi, Matiangi states that he's awaiting IPOA's report an ongoing investigation on the harassment of journalists at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport last week. And of course, uh, some of these journalists include our Stephen Leto, uh, a KTN journalist, and an NTV cameraman as well. So the committee at this time firing questions left, right, and center to CS Matiangi, uh, the police boss, and the immigration boss. Let's talk about some of the issues that they have talked about. Um, uh, Kihalangwa at this moment stated that the ID Miguna holds is now an illegal document. He must apply for a new one while applying for a passport, uh, talking about the coming in of the 2010 constitution and insisting that all uh, Kenyans who sort of changed citizenship and went and lived abroad and then have chosen to come back and live in Kenya would need to regularize their documentation, regularize their citizenship. And he says Miguna falls into this particular category. On CS Matiangi's part, he's concerned with how the judiciary has handled this matter. He stated that it's like there's a race on which judicial officer will indict the government and the higher the officer, the better. So he is concerned about that particular matter. And he says it's not just about the judiciary. Or it's not about the judiciary. It's a clique of officers, activists, and civil societies. Um, one can sell poison and get court orders to do so. How can one person obtain over 30 orders ex parte? How? And, 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 and C.S. Matiangi taking time to talk about the gamble, gambling in this country and how his ministry has been trying to crack down on it. But every time they move in a particular area or county, court orders are given out in courts of law and they do not have a chance to defend themselves. Now, C.S. Matiangi has talked about Kenya's international image and how hard 
Uh, his ministry has worked, of course, led by the president, to boost Kenya's image. And he says we are under review when it comes to getting direct flights to the USA. And he's linking this with the Miguna saga, saying already our competitors like the Ethiopia Airlines have gotten a third license for direct flights. Uh, he also goes on to say that he apologizes for the lapse at the airport uh, and he's working on a full-blown investigation, but he's sort of using this to justify why they had to carry to act the way they did in the in the Miguna Miguna saga, saying that mistakes of the past, like selling passports, is really hurting our country's image. He also goes on to say, I dare say, some of the ministers who headed the ministry in the past were part of the mess, and and um, he ex he says that they will clean up the mess, no matter who is involved. We are not in this job to get popular. He's also said that Mashari and Jero Vaipoa, they are meeting tomorrow to talk about the, the conduct of the police towards j uh, journalists at the airport last week, uh, Monday night, I believe. That, that, that's when that particular happened. And he also said on this media issue, when do you see journalists filming the immigration section of an airport? So he says that's, that was already a lapse. And, uh, but as to the treatment of journalists, he says he's going to meet with uh, Aipo as uh, Masharian Jero, and then uh, he'll issue a more detailed statement in regards to that once that report is out. A couple of interesting questions that have been posed uh, to that team, they're led by, of course, by C.S. Matiangi, is uh, one of the questions that was asked was, it's clear that Miguna came to cause a fight. Did you play into his hands? Did you deal with a fly using a hammer? And another member of parliament also asked Honorable Shuri, who gave the orders for the media to be clobbered? Who, why did you not share this information? In a press conference, intelligent people would have seen the sense in, in regards to that as well. Um, so those are some of the questions that are being fired at this moment at this Parliamentary National Security Committee over the deportation of lawyer Miguna Miguna, C.S. Matiangi, the police boss, immigration P.S. Kialangwa, really being put to task to explain, to answer. This is the first time that they've, you know, in a, in a sense really come out this publicly to address a lot that happened in the nation over the last one week, uh, the, you know, with the drama at the airport, drama at the courts. We've seen Miguna Miguna's lawyers drastically or frantically trying to uh, serve court orders to some of the gentlemen who are in this room, uh, but they were not able to trace them, they were not able to trace senior JKIA officers, and so they had to sort of pin those court orders uh, on the walls of offices as well. And C.S. Matangi has also been as bold as to say that some of the counsel for Miguna Miguna have lied in court. They've gone to the courts and said that Miguna's passport was confiscated. And C.S. Matiangi is asking, if Miguna's passport was confiscated, how has it now suddenly appeared uh, in Miguna's position in Dubai as he left to Dubai, headed to Canada? Where has that passport been all this time? And for C.S. Matiangi, he's calling on the LSK uh, to crack the whip on its members who, uh, he says, lied in court. Uh, as well. So a lot coming out of this particular um, committee meeting, nas parliamentary national security committee rather, and uh, we continue to listen in, uh, hear some of the questions that are being asked uh, to the gentleman in question there, C.S. Matiangi, uh, police boss Boynet, uh, immigration P.S. Gordon Kialango, and of course when it comes to interior, the, the whole, uh, the leaders are there, of course the interior C.S., um, the C.A.S. is there, the P.S. is there as well, so let's continue uh, to listen in confirmed to us to get that far. But then how they were removed from there, also, especially because it was being done as it was being covered, also part, played a part in how, in, in getting us to the point where we are having a fight with the media. Simple things like those uh, might be how we build this country and just move it forward. And, and whether that's something you'd be willing to consider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Um, thank you. I know many of us want to ask questions, yeah. but the time will not allow us. I will uh, yeah. say we give ourselves another uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'll be brief. And Chair, I have a problem. And the problem is that the questions I wanted to ask has been asked by some of the members, but this is a matter of great national and international interest. And I want to compliment Wazir for his shed light on some of the issues. But I want to say that it is there is a cardinal principle of the judiciary that, however outrageous the court order may be, you can only go and revert it back through that system. And uh, I want to compliment our chair for your presence here because you have talked that you have the spirit that all of us are concerned that is need for tranquility and peace 
in this country so that we can prosper. And uh, to the best of everybody's knowledge, you can see this has been a matter of great national interest. The presence of Jimmy Aguinier, the longest serving member of parliament in this house, and the many friends of this committee going up to the controversial Kete. <laughs> <laughs> some of these things, but I think we need to really concentrate. The rules of natural justice require that we listen to the other side. So we mentioned a lot from the age, and we hope the chairman will create an opportunity so that we also have the page and maybe the other lawyers, so that we could bring who are representing Meguna, so that we could bring this matter to the rest. I think the recent golden handshake of our two leaders are certain impetus that we all need to follow. So if there's a disconnect to the judiciary, I think we need to address it in a very diplomatic manner. Because we also have a say, Wazir, I'm a lawyer of over 22 years standing, 25 years standing, and uh, who are served in private practice have also worked for the government. But I think we did us not take the internet. So to me, I think that I would address this to the IG that he needs to be more proactive, I think, in his office. Yeah, you need to be more proactive so that the rest of this thing is more proactive. Thank you, Chair. We are all aware that the Ministry of Justice has been the Ministry of